You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Well, friends, because you demanded it. Today's episode is going to be super zesty, super fun, and personally, one of my favorite topics of discussion. And I'll just go out on a limb here that if the whole reason we've been doing systematic ecology led to this particular episode, then it's all been worth it. Yeah, folks, welcome to another episode of Systematic Ecology. What if we found life on another planet for real? And I love these what if episodes. You know, what if it's a big part of geek culture. It's been a part of like Marvel Comics and alternate timelines and multiverse. And there's been TV shows. It's a great thought experiment about what if this happened or what if that happened? Uh, we could what if our lives a lot and it could be done in an unhealthy way. But in the geek verse, what if in someone's origin story or uh, what would happen if this character became a villain or not has, has been really fun to kind of play around with, uh, you know, kind of alternate storylines. And that's that's what we do with these episodes, these what if episodes. And what we've been doing that I think has been really fun is we've been putting up on social media uh, like four what if scenarios and letting you, the listeners, those who are on our Facebook uh, page or in social media vote and you all choose the particular what if episode we do next. And as I was watching the voting come in for this particular episode, I wanted this one to win so bad. It, did, it took all that I could do to have self-control and not vote myself or weigh in in the comments. Uh, but But you chose it. And I'm super excited. So uh, what if we actually found life on another planet for real? Or what if they found us? Um, I've thought about this, about this question a lot. I've read a lot of books about it. I've talked with my friends about it. My co-host here just had a conversation with his wife about it. So we are we are really excited about it. I am Will Rose. And um, what I've been geeking out on, I'm, I'm a, it's no, it's no secret. I'm a big surfer. I've been surfing my whole life, lifelong surfer. I think about it. I think about that and the what if aliens question like every day. So um, the new season of the World Surf League, the WSL, starts this weekend in Hawaii. And Hawaii and the North Shore and California have been getting slammed by huge swells. And the forecast is looking good for the kickoff of a new season of, of surf uh, competitive season pro surfers and I've been following all these pro surfers on Instagram and seeing clips of waves that are coming into Hawaii and the North Shore and uh, it's looking fun super good and I'm geeking out hard on on these pro surfers in the start of a new season so that's what I'm geeking out on um, hey David how are you doing where is home for you what are you geeking out on hey Pastor Will it's David uh, <laughs> I'm glad to be here and uh, I'm here in Greenville, South Carolina. And nice. lately I've been geeking out on uh, Parks and Rec. I love nice. that show. My wife and I actually just binged the whole show recently. And now we're kind of sad because it's over and the <laughs> ending tied everything up real well. And mm -hmm. we just kind of want something to fill that void in our lives. And I've <laughs> also geeked out on an Assassin's Creed game, which I have I haven't been into that franchise in a long time. And in one of the more controversial entries, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but I just, I love uh, how much research they did to make the the world feel as accurate as it could to what historians believe it looked like. And I, I find that really interesting. So I've been geeking out on that. That's super cool. Yeah, I'm not a huge video gamer, um, but I love hearing like the suggestions and recommendations, what people are geeking out on, on systematic ecology. And I am pretty amazed at like, you know, I'm, I'm one of the older hosts here on systematic ecology and like my games that I played with as a kid, video games, does not compare in the graphics of what's going on today. And I'm just amazed at what they can do and create in the storylines. And now they're making like TV shows and movies off of these video games uh, that people have been playing for years. So that that's fun. And uh, Parks and Rec. Yeah, we're big uh, Parks and Rec fans in our household as well. It's one of those shows whenever it comes on, you catch it, you just can't stop watching it. It's just it's so good. Now, did you watch uh, Saturday Night Live where Audrey Plaza uh, hosted um, April? was the host of Saturday Night Live this past past week. And they had some good park parks and wrecks, Easter eggs and moments there on, on Saturday Night Live. No, I didn't know that. I uh I'll have to check that out. Chris yeah. Pratt is actually 
Uh, he might have left already, but he's been in Greenville the last couple of days, and I've just been driving around hoping to just run into him and snap a picture. But uh, I, I, I guess I just missed him, man. He was actually just getting lunch downtown yesterday. Nice, nice. Star Lord himself was yeah. there, and, and he heard that. were they filming a movie there, or just he's he's hanging, chilling? No, uh, one of my friends read a magazine saying that he's just visiting a friend. Nice. That's fun. Yeah, I would check out that Saturday Night Live. It was, it was pretty good. There's some good sketches, and they have some good Parks and Rec moment in, in that. So if you're looking for a way to get some Parks and Rec stuff, uh, Audra Plaza, um, she's she's pretty good in what she does, and, and she did it on Saturday Night Live. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, before we get into uh, the episode, just a couple of plugs here at the beginning. I want to share with our listeners to, to hop on our Patreon page. If you're not a Patreon yet, hop in. It only is a few bucks a month to, to be a part of that. We really have some great extra content and great episodes that have, have dropped on there. One is um, that I did on Jack Kirby, uh, the king of comics, and kind of his history and life and his legendary status as a comic book creator and um, artist. Uh, that was a super fun episode. And then I'm really excited about uh, Drinks with Tejas. And he sat down with friend of the show, Josh Patterson, who is the host of Rethinking Faith, uh, a great podcast over there. If you're kind of more of the progressive um, kind of on the spectrum of Christianity, more of the progressive style, but also kind of rethinking your faith and, and deconstructing or reconstructing a, a healthy faith. Um, he, he does some good work over there. And he also happens to be a brewer at Full Tilt, Full Tilt Brewery um, in Baltimore. And uh, met him at theology beer camp that we hosted at our at our church, and he he brewed the beer for that event called Process Party, and he um he did a great job. So go over there. I can't wait to listen to that episode with him and Tejas and see what they talk about. Uh, that'll be super fun. So let's get into the episode. All right, David, uh, we got to get warmed up. It's such a heavy topic. We got to get warmed up just a little bit. We can't just jump right into it. So in thinking about aliens, think about extraterrestrials. Um, what is your favorite alien movie, your favorite movie with aliens in it? It doesn't have to be the one that Ridley Scott did, but uh, it, that could be your favorite one. And that's fine. But if, do you have a favorite alien movie or franchise out there that you go to when you think about UFOs? aliens outer space life out there on other planets i thought a lot about this and <laughs> it is a really hard question to answer because i don't want to give something cliche like oh obviously star wars episode i don't know like five or whatever mm -hmm. uh so i want to give a controversial opinion mm. and i'm going to say wally -E. and you're okay. probably thinking, you're probably thinking wait there's no aliens in that movie okay but i'd like to give you this counter offer mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that every one of those people born on the axiom outside of earth is an extraterrestrial <laughs> and eve nice. i mean if you want to get into the topic of like is where does artificial intelligence become alive mm -hmm, i mm -hmm, mean mm -hmm. eve was made in space and i think that movie brings a pretty clear argument for her and wally being alive so she was created in space, and if she's alive, is she an extraterrestrial? So yeah, I'll say Wally. I like it. I like it that you you found a loophole, and and you're right because like terrestrial means Earth, Terra, Earth, terrestrial. If it's not on Earth and outside, yeah. So say say we put a space station on Mars or on the Moon or whatever, and people are born there. Are they extraterrestrial because they were not born on Earth? Um, good. I like the way you're thinking there. And I, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Like I, for me, like my, the first movie I remember really even seeing in the theater was Star Wars and that cantina scene of all those aliens. Some of them look like devils. Some of them look like little walruses. Some of them, you know, are weird shapes and noises and sounds. And, and uh, man, that, that just blew me away as a kid. So I'll always say that Star Wars is my favorite kind of outer space kind of alien movie, but a, but a recent one that, that really kind of um, talk about deep and made you think uh, was the movie Arrival. Have you seen that one, oh, David? Oh, yeah. Oh, that one's yeah. freaky. So freaky. And it really kind of stretches what you're thinking of to how we would communicate, how would we react. It kind of leads into like, what if 
we really did discover aliens out there. They discovered us. What would the communication be? Um, there's the classic close encounters of the uh, third kind with with uh, that Spielberg did from back in the 70s. That that's really good. That kind of goes into that. You have um, then there's you know, War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells, you have the alien movies. There's a lot of scary things uh, that goes along with aliens because because really humans have this thing about the other, right? Yeah. Um, and, and really what this does, when we think about aliens, it really dives deep into what thinking about what it means to be human and how we respond to the other, to the alien. We don't Ooh. necessarily have to go to outer space to think about, um, you know, aliens who are foreigners, people who aren't like us. We, we have a long... Uh, kind of history and track record that how humans have responded to those who are different from us. So, so aliens think about aliens is kind of science fiction, speculative fiction to think through how would we respond. And hopefully these movies kind of help us cope, help us like think through these big questions before it even happens. So yeah. Yeah. David, what do you think? So, so that makes me want to, can I, since TJ is not here yet, can I actually give a second, like a runner up? Oh, 100%. Because you talking about, uh, these movies making us think of how we would communicate uh, a quiet place, mm. a quiet mm-hmm. place that that movie has to do with like all those creatures are aliens and they're hungry, they're ravenous creatures and you have to be completely quiet mm-hmm. or they could hear you from miles away. That has to be one of my all time favorite movies. I love it. It's just a great suspenseful flick. I mean, the oh, entire man. time. I Oh, my gosh. It was. You could hear a pin drop in the movie theater when I watched it. It was awesome. I've never gotten so immersed in a movie like that, especially when you consider like none of the protagonists had names or anything. And, right. and the entire movie was was told it just told like a close family story about like what a parent would give for their child and all that. But yeah. besides that, yeah. How would we communicate with creatures? Do we even know if they can speak or if they can hear or all these other mm-hmm. things? Just mm-hmm. yeah, that's runner up movie for sure, a quiet place. Now, what did you think of the second the second one? Did you see the se- the second one? The second I movie? did see the second one and mm-hmm. I felt it was a great middle chapter that needs a conclusion. The yeah, movie was fantastic, but I think it was made to be supplemented by a third entry i don't think i think it was a great movie on its own but i think it's an incomplete movie oh yeah yeah the first one was great and then it it did so well you're like oh we gotta make a second one and i think they are gonna make a third one um it it lends itself to that and it made a lot of dough so it will but but i love the you know they just kind of drop us in the middle of the story in that first movie and you're like well how do they get here how did how did this happen? It kind of dropped you in the middle mm-hmm. of it, and then the second movie sh- shares and shows how the aliens got here. And that opening scene of like Gosh, the meteors yes. coming in, the ships coming in, and and them just kind of unleashing was just so freaking incredible. I I love that. Um, I love origin stories like that too. Like I like zombie genre and zombie movies. I really like the beginning when people are starting to wake up and realize what's really going on. Yeah. Like it's like the thick at Walking Dead really lost its steam for me because we get in the thick of it. You know, you can only do so much with with zombies in that genre. But that initial reaction of how people react and what they cling to and what they care for. And I think there is there is a close they're they're kissing cousins, you know, apocalyptic um literature or movies along with sci-fi and aliens they they go hand in hand because it really does hold up a mirror to ask what does it mean to be human how do i respond to the other and i do think star trek star wars uh these alien movies help us think through what's the worst case scenario what's what are the ideas and the values um that we have to bring to the table that we would hope they would as as well and then there there's been like c.s lewis with his space trilogy and then uh, Le, um, Madeline La Ingle with a wrinkle of time have kind of um, have thought through this um, from a faith perspective too, theologically and philosophically. What that comes into play because we are spiritual creatures and we ask those big questions. We we can't detach or divorce that question for the big questions. Yeah, what if we did communicate or discover aliens on other planets? We yeah, there, there's a human story, but man, there's there's a religious one, there's a faith story, there's a philosophical and theological dimension to, to how we will respond to that as well. Um, hopefully in a healthy way, and there's definitely unhealthy ways as as well. So um, good. Yeah, that's good warm up. These movies help do that, and then we'll continue to do that. Um, so, okay, the big question, the big question, David, what if we discovered aliens on another planet or they discovered us? How do you think the world would react 
Well, historically speaking, humans have always, always had a great reputation of dealing with the unknown. I mean, when <laughs> <laughs> when the U.S. was colonized, it was a completely peaceful endeavor. I mean, mm-hmm. that's uh, right. That's right. Why yeah. wouldn't we do that again? We do yeah, that exactly. same thing every mm-hmm. single time. I mean, hundred percent track <laughs> record of being the most peaceful and calm species that God has ever made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we make a tool and we use it for building things, not killing other people. Yeah, exactly. When when we build tools, we don't use it to hurt others. No, we want to help build someone a house or a roof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. at the beginning of you saying that you were like i didn't read the sarcasm and i was like uh do, <laughs> is he being serious we have a good track i was like uh-oh here we go but then i got <laughs> the sarcasm sunk in i'm like oh yeah yeah i see what you're going i see what you're doing there oh <laughs> uh, yeah 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 i think yeah we we yeah how the world react um and then i i like to think about like how would a religion react as well and um if we did encounter aliens, who speaks for Earth? And, and yeah, uh, seriously, uh, like who 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 do we go to? And there's so much diversity, and there's so much polarization now. I, I do think it, it would be really difficult, and it, it is a great what if because it's like, okay, how would Muslims respond? How would Jews respond? Christianity? How would this country respond? How would this other country? And I think a good picture and snapshot of what could happen is kind of what just happened in 2020 with uh, how we responded to COVID. There is all kinds of responses from uh, politicians and religious leaders and churches and faith communities and and uh, neighborhoods that how do we respond to like COVID and a global pandemic, whether it's debating science or not, or mask or not, or how we take care of our neighbor or not, or whether we think it's a controversy or whether, you know, uh, you can't shut us down. What are we doing? Like all those things and how we reacted ar- around COVID, I think is also analogous to probably how we're going to respond. Um, I don't think not if, but but when we have that particular time when we discover there is life on, on other planets. Yeah. I mean, Oh gosh, this is such a loaded question because mm-hmm. I mean, you're we're we're over here talking about like the how we present ourselves to the aliens for example. I mean, that could be like I mean, you've seen you've seen in TV shows and stuff and even historically whenever there's been time capsules, people argue about well, what should be in there? Or mm-hmm. uh even in the past NASA sent out rockets or and and signals with just pictures of just random human events like humans building a factory or naked people and it's like well if aliens see this what are they gonna what are they gonna think of it you know it's gonna look like probably a pile of rocks to them or whatever (laughs) and then then there's the whole other question of like if aliens were to like visit us then we don't know what they're bringing with them we don't know what kind of radiation they're bringing with them or Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or like mm -hmm. Like when when Europeans came and colonized the United States, one thing that we don't really learn a whole lot about in history is the plagues that they brought on they brought on to the Native Americans and just how terrible they were, where they wiped out hundreds of people, thousands of people. I mean, they almost took out entire tribes of yeah. Native Americans just from like hay fever or you know things that right. Europeans right. had already built an immunity to. What what would these what would these extraterrestrials bring to us that that our bodies or our plants or our animals or just our yeah. earth wouldn't be ready to deal with? Yeah, you're right. Oh, man, another uh, one of my favorite um, kind of sci-fi and kind of prophetic um, apocalyptic authors, Octavia Butler, an African-American sci-fi writer. She wrote Parable the Sower. Um, she also had a sci-fi series. I forgot the name of the book, but I read it. It's a short story about this alien, but it's almost like Venom from like the Spider-Man universe in terms of this bacteria or this microbe that kind of takes over and gets into a system and then takes over and it's sentient. So, so that person's not thinking for themselves. So you, you, you want to think about those kind of things. Yeah. What, what would a, a bacteria or a virus or, um, yeah, just what would hay fever be like or allergies from another planet <laughs> that's brought here? It, you know, that we got to think through those things. Yeah, we, we, we really do. And we, we'll ask a little bit about, um, remind me a little bit about later on, remind me to talk about, it's not just thinking about life, um, but intelligent life. How do we communicate with those things? Movies have done that before. Um, but but it, I think there's a difference if we 
discover there's intelligent life who try to communicate with us we try to communicate back there's another one if we like find a planet that has like an atmosphere and plants and microbes and and like uh really kind of low low biology life there kind of on on the ground versus like someone uh, a creature that's conscious that can communicate and do math equations with us or 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 swap um you know uh secrets on on inner space travel kind of thing that 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 would be kind of a difference so there's kind of these levels of discovery and how would we react and so we have a little we have clues in our history like how europeans colonized uh they it's one thing to cross an ocean but we could just cross space i like to think space is just another ocean to cross to another another planet and and what would we do if we found other life there will we act the same way that the colonists did the the native americans and then um how what how we reacted to to global pandemic and and how we can pull together as one world one human species and work together mm. um and then there's another thing that, that Dave and I were talking about before we got on is that actually the Pentagon in a, a few years back released footage of like UAPs and they, they were, they were careful to not name them UFOs because that has a stigma and a lot of baggage with it. So they renamed them <laughs> UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena rather than UFOs. And so they named them UAPs to say like, Hey, um, we're seeing some weird things stuff here and uh, we can't explain it and we don't know if they're extraterrestrial or if they're from here all the pentagon was saying is like this creates a national security uh problem if it is another country or if it's from another planet we we have to kind of think through this and they decided to release this to to the public or or somebody broke the story and it's one of those things where I was surprised that no one batted an eye. I mean, some people did. My my circle did. My family did. We love outer space. We love the stars. We love thinking about physics and quantum physics and 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 all that kind of stuff. And so, of course, we're thinking about aliens and spaceships and all that all the time. So when that when that news broke, we were like, "This is a big deal," and the world just kind of kept going. We were a little worn out from a global pandemic, but um, I was surprised it did not create as much like hysteria as I thought it uh, has, I thought it would. David, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you remember first hearing that or seeing that footage on, on online? Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing it on like Snapchat and TikTok and stuff. And really the only thing I heard about it was just how crazy it was that nobody cared. Right. And I mean, that's just, I remember I saw it. I thought, man, this is crazy. And then everyone just moved on. And first of all, it had me thinking, the Freedom of Information Act is one of the greatest things to ever happen yeah. because, I mean, I don't know who had to get killed to release this information, but it is crazy <laughs> to me that the government just randomly just openly declassifies files that, you know, are are potentially world changing and yeah. – because they don't have to – they, I mean they release the information, they declassify it, but they don't have to publicly say, hey, this specific information is released. You know, People actually have to go sort through that and find things that we would find interesting like the uh, UAPs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, UAP. And, and it's one of those things that was a little weird that they chose that particular time to release it. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I'm kind of like, are they trying to like divert our attention from what's really going on with a kind of a global pandemic and politics itself? So, you know, you can get the conspiracy theories out and they've been out for a long time. Thoughts of UFOs and what the government knows or doesn't know and Area 51 and and all all that stuff. But um, but but it was it was somewhat weird to me that we didn't make a bigger dig deal about it. And I, I, that gives me a little bit of hope that like humans either are like, Hey, we got a lot going on. We're stressed out. We're going to be okay. We'll let the government ha handle it. Or, or, or maybe we need to be more worried that we didn't make a bigger deal about it. So, <laughs> um, and Oh, David, we yeah. got an interstellar message just a second ago, uh, and beamed down to us in the middle of this episode. We have one of my favorite, um, biologists, and geeks that are on the planet and it's uh it's tj he he's beamed he beamed down to us uh to grace us with his presence and so he's going to enter into this conversation uh tj um what were your thoughts when uh when the government the pentagon <laughs> released footage of uaps what, I, mean, what, what? <laughs> I wasn't surprised <laughs> right you know like we've seen the footage it was just a lot easier to say, well, that's probably not an alien. 
until the government was like, oh, well, we don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea what that is. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah. And I think it's one of those things is like, maybe we've been so worn down from sci-fi or we've heard the stats of how many stars and planets there are in our, in the observable universe that, you know, 400 billion solar systems and stars and, and the, the probability and the stats match up that there probably is life out there, whether it's intelligent or not, we don't know whether it's been visited or not. It's just, we've been kind of bombarded with these kind of stats that once we go like, oh yeah, that seems possible. And the government knows what it is. They're a little worried because it has some tech that we can't pinpoint. But, but you know, it's not. It didn't surprise the world because I think most people would be like, "Yeah, that makes sense." When we see our universe, that yeah, they're they're yeah, possibly are aliens out there in the world. Yeah, it's the, the Fermi universe. paradox. That's it. That's it. Fermi paradox. Good. I was going to bring that up, TJ. You're just in time. Um, explain to our listeners. I'm sure they know. But uh, how would you summarize the Fermi paradox? So. Basically, the Fermi paradox is phenomenon, the paradox of it being so incredibly likely that there is life out there with no evidence, no conclusive evidence. Right. Right. It's just, it's got to be, you know? Why is it so quiet out there? If the stats line up that there are probably a lot of planets around stars that are in that kind of Goldilocks zone, um, the Hadwell zone that the Earth is in. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then then why is it so quiet out there? Why haven't we seen it? Why haven't we been? So some people we think we have been, and the government's keeping that a big conspiracy or not. Um, but but why is it so? There, there's a lot of good scientists, credible scientists, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that are they're listening hard and can't wait to share the information if they do discover it or not. Um, but yet it's still really really quiet, and we haven't we haven't really heard much. Yeah. So there's a couple of explanations there are a couple of resolutions mm -hmm. to the Fermi paradox uh one of them the scariest one is the great filter mm -hmm. which, which states basically uh life can be formed on other planets but there's a, a barrier there in the form of you know catastrophic crust failure meteors anything that's mm -hmm. just destroying life before it reaches a stage where it can communicate with the other life in the universe yeah, we get to a certain point and we blow ourselves up. Like we 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 get to our we get to a point of like civilization where we create like nuclear energy, and then we like Dave and I said, whenever we figure out a cool tool that can help humanity, we immediately turn it into a weapon and blow up people. So um, that could be something too. Uh, nuclear fallout could be the great filter, yeah. or maybe it's social media or TikTok or or something <laughs> like that, that. That is the great filter. <laughs> Systematic ecology is the great filter. That's right. We peaked, yeah. and then yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was. This is from thepearlsource.com, and it says, and I promise I'm going somewhere. The one in ten thousand uh, oysters would actually have a pearl, but one in one million uh, are the odds of any mollusk producing a pearl that's gemstone quality. Mm. And so that's because the the environment has to be so perfect for a pearl to be viable to be added to a necklace or a ring or any kind of jewelry i mean there may be oysters that have pearls but the chances of a pearl being big enough to be put on a necklace is one in a million and so that's mm -hmm. why we end up making like you know lab made pearls and all that mm -hmm. but then thinking about that in a larger scale just the it, thinking about it like probability and statistics style, uh, there may be other planets, one in 10,000 planets out there that can sustain some kind of life, but the odds of intelligent life or mm. like life that is in the perfect condition, like, like ours is on earth would probably be closer to one in a million. And you spread that out across the cosmos and the, the solar systems and galaxies. I mean, maybe, there is, I mean, there likely is life somewhere out there, but it's just so far out there that we just mm -hmm. haven't been able to co communicate. Yeah. Right. Another problem with finding life on other planets is we can communicate, you know, just in a general direction. We can send out radio waves. Uh, there is nothing to confirm that whatever life is on another planet, because it would be different. It would almost have to be different. But... There's no telling if they'll be able to pick up radio waves, if they definitely won't understand our language, any of them. Uh, but that would be crazy. 
Uh, there's so many factors going into it. They might just not like us. That's that's probably my favorite theory. They just don't <laughs> like us. I, I really – yeah, I like the idea, whether it's Star Trek um, Prime Directive kind of thing, that perhaps we're not ready yet. We need to get our crap together first before um, they they really kind of sell there. We're being watched and observed, and, and maybe we brought into the Intergalactic Council at some point when we get to a point where we can learn not to blow up each other and, and kill each other or colonize each other, those kind of thing. We get our racism in check, that, that kind of thing. That like, um, and, and maybe there is this kind of intergalactic sanctions um that that's been put on us and that's why it's yeah. it's so so quiet um that that we haven't had like clear communication from from others and maybe this little thing the pentagon is has picked up are are kind of rebel ships that are breaking the intergalactic sanctions or not i don't know um yeah. i kind of like to think that could also be these kind of weird things could be us from the future or it could be like some kind of quantum computing that someone's discovered from maybe in different dimension or different time zone or different whatever level that that's kind of break it into to our reality. That, that could be something rather than uh, just straight out aliens there. There's also reality that we create things like satellites and Mars Rover and the James Webb telescope and, and drones and AI. We send them out to space. Most likely we're going to encounter not necessarily like biological intelligent life from another planet. We're going to probably interact with this tech first. Um, and, and that would be something to kind of what, what, what kind of robot or AI or whatever is sent this way to communicate before they ever get here. Because like Dave and I were talking about, like, we don't know what the biological situation is in terms of viruses or, mm -hmm. or, or what, or bacteria that we can pass on. So why not send something that's a little bit cleaner that can communicate first. And, um, there's a book I'm going to talk about a little bit more here, but a big recommendation that helped me think through this is a book by Paul Davies called the eerie silence. He's, um, an astrophysicist and a cosmologist. He was the head of SETI and he was the head of SETI's, um, uh, post detection task force. So there's a task force within SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that has a group of people, has a politician, a historian, it has a priest, it has a person of faith that has like all well round different kind of people from around the world that when we do detect life from another planet are brought together as a task force to think through what the next steps are. And they've already been thinking about this. So this post detection task force. And so he was ahead of that and he wrote a book called the eerie silence and, and basically asked the question, why is it so, why is it so quiet? And, and he's come on the, maybe, maybe intelligent life is super rare. If not, we're the only intelligent life in the universe that there may be life. There may be biology. There may be astrobiology out there, but in terms of like getting to a point where we have brains big enough to have intelligent conversations and um, reflect on, on our own demise or death <laughs> is pretty rare. Um, and so he kind of, and he's not even a person of faith, but he brings in religion there a little bit too, um, and and asks some big questions. One of the things that like he talks about, even though he's not a person of faith, he's like, if I talk to or able to communicate with an intelligent extraterrestrial, I want to know two things: one, do they have a religion, and two, do they have music or art, and what does that look like for them? So that's his big curiosity, and he kind of walks through the different scenarios of Fermi's paradox and and perhaps why we haven't heard and maybe encountering. Um, different kind of alien tech first before we do anything. So um, yeah, it's, it's an incredible, incredible book that helped me kind of think through the scenarios on kind of a scientific level and, and what that means. And, and part of his, you know, when he talks about religious implications, he, he tends to think that it's going to disprove God or, or kind of um, discredit Christianity since Christianity um uh, focuses on God becoming incarnate, a human being. That part, uh, 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 the huge part of Christianity, kind of the the foundation, uh, a fundamental is that God becomes flesh, becomes um, human being, and so that kind of puts special priority on humans. Um, and so, guys, in terms of you thinking through this, what what do you think the religious theological implications would be in terms of belief in God or even Christianity? This idea of of incarnation. I think a lot of people would get real space racist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please expand. I think a lot of people would get space racist. I that's a new quote from TJ that um, um, may make it on a mug or something. I think people could get really space racist. Go ahead, go ahead, expand that, please. <laughs> uh, people already talking to other people that just look different mm -hmm. tend to discriminate. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine 
the group of people that would form if there were other sentient life that we interacted with that were anti them. Specious, I guess, would be a better word for it. But mm -hmm. yeah, space racist is catchier. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because they're not in the Bible. So that, that would be a, a pretty interesting sect of, of Christianity that I'm almost certain would form, unfortunately. Yeah. David, how about you? Uh, ooh, that is that is a loaded question. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is a loaded question. Uh, mm -hmm. but should I mean should God have cre like should God have chosen to create life on another planet? That's his prerogative. I mean, he's God. He doesn't he doesn't owe us an explanation or anything. And and when looking at it through the lens of Scripture. Uh, I like, I think of Job when mm. Job was questioning God where when Job finally broke down and started questioning God, uh, starting chapter 40, God, God just showed him all these massive, incredible creatures that Job had never seen himself before. Right. You know, and God is saying, Dude, that's I, such a good pull. That's such a good pull. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. I love that. I love that. God said, I created this and I'm the only one who can control it. I'm the only one who can tell it what to do, but I don't owe you an explanation for that. And so uh let's say God did create life on another planet why would he why would he tell us why would he need to tell us I mean God right now is so focused on reconciling his creation to him I mean I think if he did create life on another planet that information would have been revealed to us long ago had Adam and Eve not fallen mm -hmm. because God's focus wouldn't be on reconciling his creation to him I mean we're at a point as humans where Jesus had to say, well, don't worry about tomorrow for it'll have enough worries of its own, you know, where God is literally just, God's like, whoa, 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 hold on. You can't even plan tomorrow. I'm trying to get you to focus on just you and me today, you know, mm. where I'm sure there's so many things that God wants to show us about this incredible infinite universe that he created. But there's, there, there came a point where we kind of almost ruined it for ourselves by, uh, by separating ourselves from him where like even Paul had to say, uh, when, when you plan, don't plan, don't say I plan on going into this city tomorrow and making this money and staying there for a week where now we have to plan and say, if the Lord is willing, because our lives have just kind of become so, so distant from God, where, where to walk with God, it requires a complete devotion to killing our flesh and the things that we naturally want to explore and to some degree of, well, okay, yes, the universe is so vast and I could explore it had sin not, would, it, would sin not be separating me from God right now, you know? And so I'm sure I am a hundred percent sure that there are so many incredible things that we have never seen or experienced that God has made because God is so vast and so creative. Any creativeness that we can have, the most creative of our minds, that's not even a fraction of how creative God is. Any humor that we have, that's not a fraction of how humorous God is. Any yeah. wisdom that we have, it's not even a fraction of how wise God is. So if we can imagine it, God already probably made it way better and perfected, way better than anything that we could imagine. But because of Adam and Eve and because of the fall we have we're just on this journey of trying to reconcile with God that is so all consuming that we that we don't get to explore all of God's creation the way he originally intended us to I like that I like that yeah I like your your pull from from Job and in that chapter where you know Job is is rightfully so very inward focused because of what he's been through but when he eventually gets an answer from God God points beyond Job's self and points to the the diversity within creation itself as a way to say look at how vast and diverse uh, creation is and that and that could go beyond beyond the stars onto other planets um as well. And I, and I think C.S. Lewis plays with uh, that idea of like of a fallen planet and what it would be like to go to another planet that hasn't had that fall or, or, or kind of break in relationship or disharmony with God. And, and, and a wrinkle in time plays with that a little bit too, and kind of its theology and, and science fiction. And, and I do also like, you know, John three sixteen, the most well-known Bible verse, um, in all of scripture for God to love the world, but the Greek word, uh, world, 
uh, used for world is is cosmos. And, and it's a Greek word. It's, it's the same word we get the word cosmos from. And it doesn't mean just world, but it means like all of creation. It means all of created existence. And so if you look yeah. at it like that, for God so loved the cosmos, all of the cosmos, there's this inter- kind of entanglement with with all of life with all of creation so when i think of like christianity being kind of undermined with the discovery of planets of because of the incarnation god becoming human in jesus uh there's still you yeah that's at the surface there's there's importance with humans but there's also this, also the solidarity with all of creation with all the whole entire cosmos with with all creatures um whether they're uh, single-celled um, bacteria or or my dog or or a giraffe or um, or a life on another planet, um, whether it's a sentient um, jellyfish hanging out beneath the ocean um, in a galaxy uh, far, far away. So I think um, all those things come into play. That it, for me, the discovery of aliens is, I think, or life on another planet is inevitable, but also it expands my understanding and view of God rather than limit it and turn inward. I think the movie Contact was a little bit dated now. That that plays around with some fundamentalist Christianity that's kind of characterized as like those carrying crosses would be the ones who would protest and blow up things and be terrorists. And well, we've seen that happen um, in our own country on January 6th up on the Capitol Hill. So I think there'd be all kinds of um, reactions and diverse of reactions, but I, I'm hoping that there'd be a contingent see that it would like expand our view of the universe and our understanding of God rather than limit it and put barriers on it. Yeah. I mean, I believe that a healthy Christianity would be solidified by this discovery Mm -hmm. in the same way that Job's faith, Job never got an answer to his questions that he was asking God. Right. There's a reason, (laughs) but he was satisfied with what he got because he saw that the vastness of God was so much more than his understanding. And so I think a healthy Christianity, a healthy relationship with God would only be strengthened by something like this. But sadly, most Christianity is not healthy. Most mm-hmm. Christians around the world are not healthy. And so we would see, I believe we would see a lot of egos clash. We'd see a lot of big name pastors and leaders uh, in the religious world, not just in Christianity, but just all over world religions would be scrambling to kind of say, well, we knew it all along or, mm-hmm. you know, like, or there would be avid deniers, avid mm-hmm. uh, naysayers of like, oh, no, it's obviously fake, you know, and <laughs> that would, right. and as it became more real, as it became more proved, they would either have to retract those statements or double down, turning even more people away from the faith, sadly. And so I believe an unhealthy Christianity would have a much louder voice than a healthy Christianity would. It's right. true. That's that's the long version of what I was saying earlier. <laughs> well thought out. Space racist. Well thought out on a space yeah. racist. Space racist. Well, well, there's another book that kind of helped me think through this, and I, I can't recommend this book enough. And it's called um, – it's called Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial by Father, I always mispronounce his name, Father Guy Consomagna and Paul Muller. Um, and it's um, the, the official title of this book, uh, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial and, um, and Other Questions from the Astronomer's Inbox at the Vatican Observatory. So there's six big questions this book wrestles with in the realm of faith and science. And the last one is the title chapter, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? And and, and this uh, Catholic priest who's also an astronomer, who's a physicist, uh, gets asked in a press conference, you know, one, has the Pope ever, like, um, suppressed your scientific discovery? And he's like, no, he's never done that. And then he's like, well, would you ever baptize an extraterrestrial? And and spoiler, uh, how he answers this is perfect. It's like, only if she has to be. <laughs> and um, and it really, it, the whole chapter goes into you know, kind of speculati- speculating whether aliens exist or not. But they also go into this idea of the other of the alien that we have a history as Dave and I talked about we have a history of encountering the other and not having a good track record of how we treat the other person but also kind of this um 
baptismal theology of of one of conversation of initiation of wanting to be a part of a community and what baptism really is and and what it does in terms of like uh, the life uh, of faith and discipleship and and the book does such a freaking good job of kind of thinking through those dynamics and it lifts up for me like there's been a lot of smart people for a hundred years over a hundred years who have really thought through this question we're not the first ones to ask it there's been a lot of smart people that have think through this and that when the when the time comes or if the time comes where we have make contact uh, they they have some some things they want to say or have laid the groundwork of a good foundation of a healthy way of, of how we um, communicate or or um, or interact with with other beings now there's others you have the kind of the the faith or kind of the science fiction like nightmare of like being invaded and them having weapons and smarter and more tech that could just wipe us away or we get turned into like a a zoo and I'm a zoo creature <laughs> or, or hopefully they're, they've progressed enough or they're in communion with a creator that instill in this universal idea of love, um, that, that they come and, and have that as a part of their understanding of, of the universe. I I'm curious. It would be curious if we end up interacting with aliens or extraterrestrials and they have some kind of religion or they have some understanding of a creator, or maybe they have an understanding of, of a God who sacrificed themselves for the universe as well. Um, to, to point to like solidarity over, over death and pain and suffering, <laughs> who knows, they might have some similar, some of the, there's some similarities within our own religions. When we, um, you know, came to America, native Americans had a deep spirituality and understanding of a creator and had some stories and myths and and religion and spirituality that were were similar to our own in terms of longing for an afterlife and and being one with the spirit. So so I'd be interested to see if if they do have some understanding of religion or faith or spirituality when it comes to um when we communicate or or yeah it's going to be really interesting when they pull up with their own exact translation of the Bible. Yeah 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 no, yeah. Same God and just did it over yeah. here too. With human history and everything. Yeah, human history and all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. Like if we, I mean, again, going back to like your, like the conspiracy theory, I don't know it was David or TJ talking about like, if if we, skeptical of of even it being real or not, like what if we uncover, you know, in a glacier or in a mountain or something, earthquake opens up the earth and then we see like some kind of like space probe time capsule that's from, a civilization from hundreds of thousands or a million years ago, because they are a different stage of in the kind of time period than, than we were. What, what will we learn from that? How will we crack the code? Uh, what people react to that, whether it's, you know, skeptical or called conspiracy or fake news or whether they embrace it and be open to the possibilities. Yeah. And you, you brought up that they might just be more powerful than us. That's also terrifying. Uh, and there's a, a theory called, I guess it's a theory postulate called the Kardashev scale. Mm -hmm. uh, if another sentient life is able to come to us, uh, it means it, it's fairly likely uh, that they would be on at least the second tier of the Kardashev scale, which is only three tiers. It's about how much energy a civilization can use. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a tier one civilization. We can use and store all of the energy on our planet. But the scale is exponential. So yeah. a tier two civilization can use and store all of the energy in their star, which is a lot more energy mm -hmm. yeah. than Earth, uh, which also has a bunch of other implications about what they're able to do and what we are not able to do. Yes. So that would be a little scary. Yeah. So, yeah. Hope they're mm -hmm. benevolent. Are you guys familiar with AIs like uh, chat AIs and yeah, uh, chat uh, those kind of like, yeah, like chat GPT, exactly. So... Uh, I've been messing around with it. Like I'll put in a, a famous preacher's name or something and tell it to give me a sermon by them. And it'll basically like write a sermon with the points and everything. But, uh, I had wrote, I had asked it to write me a sermon by Elon Musk as the guest speaker <laughs> about the discovery of alien life. And it's a short one. If you guys wouldn't mind, I'd love to read it to you. Dude, go for it. That's fun. Okay. Uh, and if any of the listeners know how to how to use AI to um, kind of make Elon Musk's voice read this, that would be even better. <laughs> Just please send it to us. But OK, so here's how it starts. Good morning, my fellow believers. It is an honor to be here with you today to discuss a topic that has long fascinated us all. 
the discovery of alien life. As we read in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it, is a, and it is this belief in a higher power that drives my passion for exploration and discovery. For years, I have dedicated my life to pushing the boundaries of what we know and about our universe and searching for answers to mysteries that lie beyond. And through my work uh, in, the, in the companies of SpaceX and Tesla, we have made incredible strides in our pursuit of knowledge and understanding. But recently... We have made a discovery that has the potential to change everything we thought we knew about our place in the universe, the discovery of alien life. Now, I know that this news may be difficult for some to accept. It challenges our understanding of who we are and our relationship with God. But I believe that it is a discovery that can only strengthen our faith and deepen our connection to the divine. We read in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the discovery of alien life is just one more example of the incredible majesty and wonder of our creator. We must embrace this discovery with open hearts and minds and continue to seek out the truth and knowledge that is waiting for us in the vast expanse of space. Let us not be afraid of what we may find, uh, but instead be inspired and awed by the infinite possibilities that await us. For in the words of Isaiah 55, 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. May we continue to seek out the wonders of our universe always. And remember that we are not alone in the great adventure of discovery. Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what in, I know. What incredible what if within a what if. We just got meta. So we what if Elon Musk was a believer and took scripture and aliens and put it all together. And that's the message we get, which wasn't that shabby. I that was that yeah was well honestly done. for an honestly. AI that was that was good. <laughs> I looked up the scriptures; they accurately quoted them and everything. I know, I know that that's pretty that's pretty rad. Um, I like it. Um, I and, and again, like you know, I I think yeah, there will be a diverse of reactions uh, around the world in religions and and countries and rulers and politicians. But but I I love what. Um, these pre say and would you baptize an extraterrestrial that that thinking about extraterrestrials is a way for us to reflect on what it means to be human and what is our relationship with God, uh, not only with us and God, but with us and other humans and other species as well. It's not just me and David and TJ, but what about, you know, how I treat my dog? What about how I treat the environment, how I treat the oceans, how I treat that's what's in the oceans? What, it, what, what is going to be my stewardship of resources on another planet? And, and what do they have to share and gifts do I need to learn from them? I learn from David, like he learns from me. And what could I learn from an alien? Um, and what could they learn from me? So, so, so I'm hopeful. Uh, I, we we don't have a great track record, but perhaps we can progress in a way, evolve in a way, um, and grow in a way where where we definitely have like a way of understanding the other as a gift rather than than like the enemy or or someone there to oppress. And I think there's a quote within that book too that I, I had I have to read as well that I think it it even has a what if in it. So. Uh, a quote a quote from Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? What if whatever it is that God loves about us is not something that distinguishes us from the rest of the universe, but rather is something that we have in common with the rest of the universe? So it's not necessarily God loves me and that makes me better than that, but it's really my, our common ground where we begin with um, my brother and sister here on Earth, but also perhaps on another planet as well. Uh. Good, good stuff. Um, thanks, y'all. It's, it's a cool, cool episode. It's a cool thought experiment. I could talk about this forever. We might even do a, a second part or depending on what the response is from our listeners. If we miss, I'm sure we missed something or, or, or an idea. Um, there's lots of books and, and ideas. Another, I got to plug, uh, Ted Peters is a Lutheran theologian out at Pacific Lutheran. I think he's retired now, but he did a lot of work with um, astrobiology and extraterrestrials and what that would mean to our faith. He um, and does a lot of work in faith and science. So you can look up Ted Peters and articles and books he's written on on how religion will react to an extraterrestrial or not. Um, there's another sci-fi book called The Sparrow. It's not for the weak of heart. Um, it is. It is. It, it's very Job-like in that this 
poor priest goes through a lot of suffering and it, the end of it is just heart wrenching. Uh, but it does it, we pick up a signal from another planet and they go back and forth and we go there. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty incredible book, but, but not for the, the weak of heart. And it goes real deep into faith and science and, and faith and suffering and, and what that could look like. Um, yeah. Guys, do you have any other recommendations or, or resources that could help get into the subject or just out there in the Geekverse? Yeah. Uh, as far as recommendations go, I, I definitely say check out the second part of this series uh, where we talk about extraterrestrial life and why it may be closer than you think. Mm, I like that. That's a good teaser there. Uh, honestly, I don't have anything. This subject is so... Uh, it's it's very niche and I didn't think that there were other books and things about it I thought this was just a fun conversation that my wife and I would have or that I would have with (laughs) friends yeah it clearly seems like something that goes through a lot of people's minds especially in in, when it comes to the faith so uh, I'm actually gonna look into some of y'all's recommendations so thank you yeah, that's awesome. And I would encourage if you're part of a faith community out there, um, perhaps get a get a small group together or a Bible study group or or people that you're walking with or cycling with to, to whether one of these books or these questions and kind of talk through it, uh, pray about it. I, I think the more we work in community with each other on this subject, the better off we'll be. Not just if like, you know, an ET comes down or a UAP shows up on our, our doorstep, but but really how we treat a person from another neighborhood or another religion or another country. Um, aliens isn't just um, those from outer space, but but how we treat, uh, treat one another, uh, refugee, aliens and all. So um, that's a big part. So thank you all uh, for listening. Uh, we uh, go over to our website. You can see all the episodes, all the hosts, what's going on there. Let us know what you think. And if there's a topic out there we're missing, uh, hit us up on social media. We're on all the socials or most of them, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. That's how this episode happened because of our Facebook uh, group. And then Patreon, as we mentioned earlier, some great episodes over there, extra content with some really fun conversations. Hop over there, join. We love to be a part of it and as always i will sign off by saying share the faith share the geek this was an anazal ministries podcast if you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network be sure to check out the anazal ministries podcast network